I now pay later from Klarna, meantime, recorded one month of profit in its second quarter, but still missed uh, out on profit for the first half of the year. Despite macro concerns, the company posted its third consecutive quarter of gross profit in the U.S. Joining us now is Klarna CEO Sebastian Simietkowski. Sebastian, great to have you on the show, back on the show. Um, you didn't mince words in this release. You, you said today's results clearly rebut the misconceptions about Klarna's business model. You also said some claimed Klarna would face difficulties in the tough macroeconomic climate with high interest rates, um, but basically that you've had a strong and resilient bu business model. I guess walk me through what you see as the misconceptions and uh, let's, put that, let's put it to rest. <laughs> well, I hope, you know, uh, at least nothing else like last May, Last year, we posted, you know, a negative EBT of $120 million. And this, this um, 12 months later, we did a slight positive, right? And the main, main reason for that is that we have a very different type of credit product than the one that the credit card companies and banks offer. So, you know, when consumers use our credit product, uh, they have zero interest or very low interest. Uh, they pay in installments. We underwrite on a real-time level every transaction. We don't use old income data from two years ago. And uh, we don't encourage people to, uh, you know, uh, accumulate too much debt, which is why the average outstanding balance is just $100 compared to $5,600 on a credit card, right? So mm. what that means is when macroeconomical changes come, as they have, um, we can, when we change our underwriting model, it takes us two months so that 50% of the balance sheet is underwritten according to the new standards, which takes, banks may take over three years. And so it gives us a very agile and robust business model that allows us to adjust to new conditions. And I'm, you know, really happy to see the results. Like you offer healthier credit, you get healthier outcomes. Mm. Um, and that's what we're seeing. Okay. Um, so, so just looking at the U.S. specifically right now, at a time where American consumers have now taken on a record amount of credit card debt, it's now topped more than a trillion dollars. Um, and there's this controversy or at least debate swirling within the analyst community about what student loan repayments starting back up is going to do uh, to, to the space and to consumer spending behaviors. Your take on all of that and whether specifically student loan repayment is going to be a headwind or not? Well, I think, again, like... Um it's obviously, it depends so much on the different consumer groups. I think that was very interesting that McKinsey did a, a research where they identified in the U.S. market, there's about 20% what they call self-aware avoiders. And, and these are basically people who have uh, grown very, very tired of the dirty tricks of the banks of trying to lure you into revolving and to lure you to, you know, show you credit limits of, to make you overspend or put all of your transactions on debit, uh, sorry, on credit rather than, you know, offering you debit or credit at every transaction to make a healthy decision. So I think that like what you're seeing is that those self-aware avoiders are, 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 you know, are much more mindful in how they spend their money. And in general, I was speaking the other day to the, uh, Ryan, the, the new CEO of Visa, and so far, because employment levels have had, held quite well, you know, loss levels are still not severely impacted. We haven't seen significant shift in credit card portfolios in the US either. So I, as long as employment stays healthy, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not expecting direct change. And also some of this is obviously some of these numbers look a little bit odd because we have to remember during COVID, people really cut their spending and used a lot of the, the checks that were flying from government in the US to, to pay down debt. And so now you're kind of seeing slightly a rebound of, of that, right? So I think some of it is just uh, we're comparing apples and bananas slightly. But, okay. but, but in general, well, you don't have to be mindful and, and have a close uh, and continue to follow it closely. Sebastian, your, your rivals over there at a firm already public uh, their stock's up 50% for the week, which, which isn't a bad comp for you. And I think they actually saw um, delinquencies, you know, bad, bad paybacks going down, um, something, quite a few basis points. What are you seeing in your customer base? Is, it, is the algorithm working? Is it doing what you expected? Are people uh, paying as expected? Yeah, I think, you know, the competitor you mentioned, there's similarities and, and some large differences. I think uh -huh. more subprime, more kind of high ticket items, clonized, more low, low frequency, everyday purchase spending and more kind of these self-aware avoiders. So it's kind of slightly different populations. But with that said, I do think that, the, you know, on the similarity side, it's definitely this what I talked about, which is the agility of the models and the ability to to underwrite on a real time basis. We have to remember that the credit card today works so that you apply for it, you you know, you have a credit check at the time of application, and then actually that's kind of it. Most of the data then is is quite ancient, and it's just not as good of a model 
comparing to underwriting in real time. And that makes a huge difference because, again, it gives you the agility when macroeconomical fundamentals change like they have.